Dear colleagues and friends, welcome back to the FIB podcast. This is the fourth episode of the Conceptual Design podcast series, and today I am hosting Paolo Tombesi. Paolo is professor of construction at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne and an expert of the Sydney Opera House, its design, construction and architectural heritage. On this line, we will dedicate almost this entire episode to one of the most iconic buildings ever made. I hope you will enjoy this interview as much as I did. So without further delay, let's get started. Hello, Paolo, how are you? Hello, how are you? Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Paolo, would you like to say uh, something about uh, yourself, your curriculum, maybe what got you into architecture and um, how, how did you go to, got to be an academic? Sure, sure. Look, I think I might spend a few, um, few words, more than a few words on this because it's a fairly idiosyncratic profile and uh, progression. So I'm, I'm originally from Italy, even though I work here, um, and um, I went to grammar school in high school. So it's classics, Latin, Greek, philosophy, history and that. And then at the end of this, I, res I decided that I was interested in two things. One was theatre and the other one was political sciences and economics. And in the end, the best way to combine the two was to actually enroll into an architectural course where you have uh, you know, the, 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 design of the, the design of the environment at the same time, the ability, I think, or the need to actually understand what are the means required to um, bring it to fruition. At the, at the beginning, when I, when I was at, um, at the architectural school in Italy, that was also a context that allowed you to do anything you wanted. Because my first year in school, there were 6,000 other students in my first year. Which means that you have all the freedom you want in order to pursue particular avenues of, um, of education. So what happens after a few years is that I decided to do, you know, it took me a long time to finish university, but at the end of it, I decided that I wanted to do a real thesis, something that would, you know, put me in good stead for the, um, for the progression of my career. I was always interested in construction, how things are made, get made in reality. And so at the time, the largest building site in the world was that of the new Parliament House in Canberra. So my professor, my supervisor in Italy said, look, why don't you go there and develop your thesis on the construction of this particular building? And the building was a, a very particular one in the sense that it was an institutional building that was actually built by using very commercial techniques of construction. And so I ended up spending one year on the construction side of that building as a student. Uh, setting up my my final thesis and of course once I get to discuss the thesis in Rome I was the only one without drawings without great photographs and everything also because it was a long time ago but um, at the same time I was the only one I think with which the entire panel could actually engage in a discussion about uh, about a design about construction about the building industry and so forth um, that, uh, in a sense, opened the doors for something else. Um, on the basis of this particular work, I got the Fulbright um, scholarship to go to America. And I decided to go to America in order to, in a sense, widen my horizons, not only geographically, but also um, metaphorically about the discipline. And at the time, there was Frank Gehry that was making the big jump from a small local firm to an international powerhouse. And so I decided to go there and develop my PhD on the construction of Frank Gehry's buildings. And in particular, I, I did my PhD <laughs> on the construction of the Disney Hall, but not so much about the, the building itself, but the way in which the building industry would organize in order to make the building happen. So, Australia. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, the work that I'd done had sort of... Um, uh, sort of uh, generated interest on the side of Australian universities that were internationalizing at that time. And so I received um, a phone call from the University of Melbourne asking me whether I wanted to move from California to Melbourne. So at that point I went there and I was still interested in architectural practice and, um, and, um, and the way in which ideas would actually transform themselves into reality. And in Melbourne, there is a museum, which is a very famous museum attached to the university, where uh, there was an exhibition of an Australian artist named Eric Tucky. Uh, 
And this meant for 20 or 30 years, every Christmas would actually design a small um, a greeting card uh, made out of, um, from a woodcut. And in 1973, so there was an exhibition at the University of Melbourne, and in 1973, the postcard was about the Sydney Opera House. And the title of the postcard was a, a Sydney Opera House in Every Home. So, in fact, what Taki was actually asking himself in 1973 was whether something that had taken almost 30 years, 25 years to build, would actually make its way into the, the households, into the common lives of all Australians. And so that really had a major impact on me because for 10, 15 years I'd been studying incredibly large buildings, monumental structures, without possibly ever asking the question as to whether these things are useful not only for themselves, but also for the society that builds them. And so that was like a, an illumination. And I said, look, wouldn't it be good to see if, you know, to, to try and investigate the actual impact of these buildings onto the society that build them. And so on that basis, uh, I decided to apply for funding with the Australian Research Council to see whether, in fact, the city of our house, which I fell in love with, I'd fallen in love with um, um, right before, um, even before going to Australia, was in fact something that could, uh, you know, provide a provide a an ideal type for that sort of um, impact, and so eventually I got I got the funding at the beginning of the of the two thousand, and I spent one or two years looking at all the contracts of the Sydney Opera House, all the companies that had taken part in the building, and what had happened to the materials, to the solutions, to the, to the, <coughs> to the assemblies that had been put onto the building. Whether the building had actually become a vessel for this type of innovations to move either from another part of the world to Australia, or from Australia to develop into something that could have been used by others. And in fact, I mean, we, we have published quite a few things on it, but it's interesting how some of the solutions that we find today in Australia on oil drilling platforms or on airports or even geothermal uh, pumps were actually introduced in the country through the, the edges and through the surfaces of the Sydney Opera House. That's, that's really interesting. Do, do you think that the Sydney Opera House is more studied now than it was before the project was built or during its construction process? Mm. Look, I think that um, the, the Sydney Opera House, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting building from this point of view because it is a building that sits at the perfect conjunction of myth and reality. So the myth has been studied, discussed, uh, you know, drowned in a plethora of publications, whereas the actual project, which is a very controversial one because it's a very complex one, has not um, been the subject of a similar of a similar amount of scholarship. Um, in fact, you know, next year we're going to celebrate 50 years from the opening of the building, and at the moment I think it's close to 30 monographs that have been published on the building. And it's interesting to know that almost all of these books don't use the drawings produced, the technical drawings produced for the Sydney Opera House, also because the drawings were not available until one or two years ago. Because the actual drawings with which the, the building was constructed and actually were sort of dispersed and scattered across different archives. So everything that we talked about, uh, most of the things that we talked about with the Sydney Opera House are either the drawings produced in the third stage, the final six years of the construction of the building, or drawings that have been reproduced after the construction of the building in order to make sense of the, of the, of the story and allow the storytelling of the Sydney Opera House to be, to be told. Um, uh, so, one of the things that I was going to say is that, um, you know, so developing such an approach to the reading of, um, to the reading of buildings, their success, uh, their popularity, their, their instrumentality in the development of the industry, sort of forces you to change your perspective, your current vision. 
So on the one hand, we have a building which is extremely um, challenging from a conceptual point of view, from a, from a technological point of view, and that forces a society, a country, to um, put together the best intelligence that one can find, not only in Australia, but from all over the world. And if one looks at the same industrial sector 30 years after the construction of the building, over 66% of the company are no longer in existence. So it means that this is an incredible um, sort of time, time war, in, in a sense, where you know, a lot of intelligence was put together to build something, and for one reason or another, the conditions, the industrial conditions were not there to make sure that all this great amount of intelligence would actually sustain itself in time. So I think there's only this thing here by itself is an amazing, um, um, is an amazing historical fact. And somehow it forces us to reflect back on what the bill, how the building industry works. And there is an incredibly high physiological friction, rate of um, uh, physiological rate of friction, in the sense that uh, it's very, very difficult for, for, um, uh, for technological experiences to survive a long period of time within the same subjects. Um, Can you make a practical example just for our listeners to be a bit less abstract? Sure. Um, well, um, if we look at, um, uh, at the people that, uh, the cooperatives that built uh, the design, that did the design development of the, um, of the glazing of the Sydney Opera House, the one on the harbour, which is one of the most incredible, uh, incredible, uh, um, you know, envelope facade projects in the history of uh, humanity, while well, those companies, that cooperative was disbanded right after the completion of the building and they're no longer in existence. At the same time, we have a company such as Permastelisa, who's world famous for the facades, and at the time of the Sydney Opera House was only providing the um, bronze fittings of the, um, of the same facade. But somehow, they were far more, they were far more um, shrewd, if you will, in their industrial, in, in industrial life. Uh, and even though they didn't do much on the Sydney Opera House, they, by design, they associated themselves with that building. And today, they actually have the Sydney Opera House in the logo of the company. Even the, the actual companies that did and built the facade of the building are no longer in existence. Okay. Is, the, is that a problem? Is that due to the fact that we don't have uh, any other follow-up buildings that were this kind of scale and did with this kind of finishings and yes. so on. Yes. So that has to do with uh, is is the is the um, you know these buildings are doomed in a sense when it comes to the industry of which they are part because um, this well the Sydney Opera House took twenty five years to build. So the the completion Instead of of the initially planned for the no, seven they, years, they, the the plans that were made or communicated but to the press, they were um, they were theoretical ones. So they were actually provided to the press because the press and the and the government needed a final date. Um, but in fact, no one knew how to build the place, the the, the building at the time, and even the cost that was given at the time was, um, was, uh, was, uh, was um, a fiction of imagination. And in fact, the first time that the actual cost of the Sydney Opera House was, uh, was, was calculated would have been, uh, what, four or five years after the, 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 the start of the building. Um, now I've lost um, <laughs> where we were. Um, uh, uh, that's a bit so no, yes, so I was going to say something about uh, the uniqueness of these buildings and how important on one side and irrelevant on the other these buildings are. Because they are important, I think the Sydney Opera House has been very important to, 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 to force the industry to look at itself, reflect on what it was capable on, and eventually bring um, technical innovations onto the site. There is one, one example, for instance, uh, 
the, um, the there was an alloy that was used um, to uh, do the, uh, the 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 fastening of the of the elements internal to the to the shells of the um, of the sails and um, um to the sails I'm sorry not to the shells and um, but of course you can't actually maintain the building because you can't actually dismantle the roof and so they needed something that had no friction whatsoever and so they use a special alloy called k -Monel. that was actually used uh, on the, um, uh, for the reconstruction of the Coventry Cathedral in England they brought this particular alloy to Australia and now that alloy is actually used on oil drilling platforms in order to put in place particular assemblies that will then not need maintenance for a long period of time so on the one side you have uh, the building, a building of such uniqueness that provides a vessel for the introduction of innovation. On the other, on the other hand, because of the of the of the delays in time vis-à-vis -vis what had been publicly announced, and also the the the. the the escalation of costs, whether or not they were real or fictional, has produced a halo of uh, mistrust about buildings of this sort. And so it becomes it's become much more difficult, particularly from the, you know, at the time of the Sydney Opera House, for any public government to actually invest great amount of resources into buildings which have great degrees of uncertainty. And if, if we look at the buildings that were done after the Sydney Opera House uh, by the public client in Australia, they were far less, uh, um, far less uh, daring from a structural point of view, from an innovation point of view, than the actual McCoy, than the real um, Sydney Opera House. Would it be possible to draw a parallel to the Elb Philharmonie in, um, in Hamburg? Well, <laughs> because... <laughs> It's also a project made by the public hand and it's also uh, overdue in time and costs are also overrun, so... Well, look, I think I, I, I don't... Uh, I remember the, the, the building when he was first uh, um, assigned, I mean, um, with the competition and all that. Um, and then I realized that it took a long time to, um, to, to develop, uh, to design, develop and build. I think the difference between a building like that and the Sydney Opera House, and possibly this is the reason why a building such as the one in Sydney is so important, is that that building built the image of the country. So Australia, at least in the eyes of the, of the, of the old world, uh, did not exist in its contemporary version uh, until the Sydney Opera House. I remember that I was a young, a young boy at the time. I wasn't even born at the time of the competition, but I was a young boy at the time of the opening. And in Italy, you could actually see the opening of the Sydney Opera House in the news. And I think it's the only time I've seen the Italian news broadcasting some in an architectural event that came from a completely different part of the world. What, what was that by intent? Well, or because it just happened. The aura, the aura of that building. Consider what you know. That building, in a sense, determined or raised the awareness of the world public about the you know the ability of a piece of building of a large scale building to actually give form and shape not only to the place the context in which the building was built but as well to the culture and to the society in which it was being built and i i i can't you know maybe the bilbao the museum in bilbao the the um something you know the guggenheim or i i, I I don't know how many other buildings have actually worked in that way to become so much a part of the public consciousness. And so that is a, is a very particular thing. The other thing is that uh, it is one of the first uh, truly international projects, simply because um, Australia, well, in a sense, many of the resources required would actually come out of the country and many of the firms that have become the greatest engineering or mechanical services firms in the world were not from Australia. So, Ove Arab and partners essentially based 
one could say, I mean, today, that based his own ascent to fame on, the, on that particular building. The same thing happened with uh, Stenson and Varming for mechanical services. So, and to a certain extent, uh, uh, this is a building that has always been associated with particular personalities, not only Utsons, but also the engineers that, um, that uh, participated in that, um, in that particular venture. Um, and so, you know, going back to your question, I think it's difficult to make comparisons with other buildings, not because they wouldn't stand up from a technical point of view, but because they wouldn't stand up from a cultural point of view. And if, if, you, if you will, I can give you an example about the importance of this building. Um, um, after the, after the, uh, the completion of the, of the study that I was telling you about, about all the companies and the amount of innovation that was produced, uh, well, the Australian government decided to nominate the building for the World Heritage Listing under UNESCO, under UNESCO uh, Charter. And so I was asked to, um, to write the technical report on what made the building um, significant for the rest of the world. Now, if you think about it, sir, uh, this is not an easy task because it is a building that is not original. So the building that we see today is not the building that his architect had designed. It's completely different. It's called the Sydney Opera House, sir, but the largest hall in the building is a concert hall. It's not an opera house because the opera house, the program had to be changed halfway through. Wow. Okay. So then uh, um, the building was not completed by his architect because Utzon resigned at the end of stage two in 1966. And so the last seven years of construction were actually put in the hands of uh, Peter Hall, an architect who was in charge of the, um, of the public architects of, of the government. Right? And so if, you, if these are the conditions under which the building was created, what is that makes it relevant to the world? Because it's not the work of art. It doesn't have a particular, with a particular author, but in fact, it is the result of a great amount of contaminations at all, on, every, on every ground. And so in the end, uh, so this was a major issue <laughs> because the World Heritage listing has to do with, uh, with um, very specific categories. So he needs to represent the work of someone significant. So it represents an idea or it represents a culture or it represents a particular place. And so in the end, uh, the listing of the Sydney Opera House was, uh, was, uh, was earned by looking at the significance of the building in relation to its site, to its context. So today is actually inscribed in the list of World Heritage Monuments uh, because of its, uh, how should I put it, its organicism with the harbour, with the Sydney harbour. So it's not because it's the work of one person, but because regardless of how many people contributed to it, uh, they contributed to making something that clarifies to the rest of the world what the relationship should be between one big piece of social infrastructure and the context and the harbour in which it is located. Okay. And so th this, is, this is amazing because everyone would think that the Sydney Opera House has become part of the UNESCO list because of these technical challenges, technological achievements, but no. Because it's this in relation to his ability to represent and embody the, um, the the genie of the place, in a certain way. Okay. Yeah. Can we can we go uh, maybe a Please. step back? Yes. And um, if you could maybe tell us uh, how Utzon uh, got this work. Yes. Um, why him, and what he had uh, better than his other competitors yeah. in the architectural design. Look, this is an interesting an interesting part of the story, I think, because I mean to start with Utzon. You know, by the time he, he won the commission, he had very little buildings under his belt and, um, and he never been to Australia. So it's something that was actually done in the 1950s, in the mid-1950s, 
based based on 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 books on photographs on the documentation that had been sent by the government and somehow hearsay so this was a highly speculative theoretical project that Woodson embarked upon now if one looks at the other buildings the other proposals that were presented for the competition all the buildings are very very traditional um, institutions from a, a theatrical typology perspective. So there was nothing innovative about the form of those buildings. So all the, and even though some of the buildings were particularly, you know, they were well developed, huh? but the buildings could have been anywhere else in the world or anywhere else in the city. Whereas the site that had been given to uh, to the commission to the to the competition, and so the promontory of what is called Benelong Point, which was a major Aboriginal site, and eventually became the the the, the, the apex of the of the tram uh, um, depot, and so where the trams going through the harbour of Sydney, the port of Sydney, would actually turn around to go back um, into the city. So that was a very, very narrow piece of land onto the harbour. And so what the young Utsun did was to develop a sculptural form. So something that was actually part of the harbour more than anything else. So it was the continuation, the completion of the harbour. But in order to do that, he wanted to put the two theatres one next to the other. And there was not enough space on, the, on Benelong Point to make it happen by using a conventional typology. And so that's why all the other buildings were not so much um, sort of jutting off the harbour, but much more at the centre of the area. Whereas Utsun decided to actually use the base of the building, which was essentially a continuation of the tectonic of the harbours and all the cliffs that you can see around it. And then on top of that, put the, uh, the shelves of the, um, of the theatres, the roofing of the theatres. But he was able to, able to do that because the basement all around uh, on which the shelves sit, in fact, were used as emergency exit for fire escape. And so all the other, co all the other competitors essentially put the, the fire escape, so the fire engineering component inside the building, whereas Utsun made it become part of the basement, of the base of the building, of the podium of the building, and this gave him enough time to place the theatres side by side. Now, <clears throat> so this is one thing which is essentially typological functional, so it's very, very uh, shrewd strategy to make something that would not normally fit fit on that side already gave him an advantage. The other thing, of course, there was an elective affinity from a formal point of view with the work of Ivo Sarinen in, at New York, uh, the TWA uh, terminal in particular, and Sarinen was in the jury together with Leslie Martin. So the story goes that Utsun's proposal had already been put into the rejection basket when Ivo Sarinen arrived a bit late and picked it up and stretched it on the table said this is the proposal that should win okay <laughs> okay having said that this is some this was a proposal done like many competition proposals today but particularly then without thinking too much about the constructability of the um, of the object so it was something that was extremely sculptural it was irregular and certainly at least at that um, at that uh, point in time not calculable <laughs> yeah. in, in, um, in structural terms. But that's how the, the story starts. Um, um, uh, was it an with, open competition or were it was an open called to... No, no, this was an open competition. Okay, so there were many, guess... many architects participated from all over the world. You need to understand that that is possibly the most scenographic place in the world. Yeah, so even at the time, and I would say that at the time, possibly this was um, was enhanced by the exoticness, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the Australia was a faraway place, so it was the distance was not just um, a geographic distance, but was also a, a cultural a cultural distance at the time. Um, so, um, so what happens next? Like Utsun got this project. So Utsun got this project. They had to put together a team that would actually make the construction possible. So Arup became a 
uh, a clear choice for the selection of um, of the engineer also because they had it's a practice that was about to become multidisciplinary so it was a practice that essentially um, you know could well adapt itself uh, to the to the to the number of challenges that were up on the horizons was it a, the, a big name already back then or? no 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 our was uh, was a, a relatively big name in um, in um, in the uk but one could say that it is the sydney opera house that cemented and the pun is intended the name of the firm into the into the 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 temple of uh, of the history of construction and the history of um, and the history of engineering so the <coughs> the <coughs> the organization of the building was uh, planned in such a way as to follow the the architecture the organization of the volume so there would be a first stage that would concern the construction of the podium essentially you know going down to the to the bottom of the harbor and then produce an extension of the landscape on which the sails of the building would be um, would be built, erected, and then the stage too. So this would take, well, in fact, I mean, you know, the, the the actual timeline changed, of course, from the from the beginning. But what eventually, was planned? Let's say. Well, no, no, the the the, the planning was uh, was was not real planning. I mean, it's a uh, it's a series of um, it's a series of um, of um, of speculations that are actually filled it through the to the press, uh, but essentially yes, it was like six or seven years. The 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 tripartite organization of the building was always there. So the podium would come first, then the shells would come second, and then the interiors would come third. As it happened, we had uh, what five six years uh, for the for the podium, including rework done by the changes made necessary by the changes to stage two, that is the shells. Then we have six years for the for the shells, and then we have another um, another seven years for the uh, for the interiors. Um, you know, it's difficult to, to, to understand the logics of all this um, because, in fact, one should divide this building in two parts. The first one is the envelope, foundations and envelope. And the second one is the interiors. And the interiors is particularly difficult as a project because it is at this point in time that people start realizing that the program as given to the architects at the time of the of the competition cannot fit into the building and so essentially we have a shell literally that is being constructed and at the same time we need to change the interior space and the and the relation to the hierarchy between the halls between the theaters because otherwise from a functional point of view the shell that is being constructed will not be able to make it work that's quite late I that's would think. that's very late mm -hmm. it's very late but it is essentially what makes this building particularly important because it shows you the sort of um, um, the sort of um, um, complete interconnection between uh, conception and construction. So it is a building that could not be conceived, was not in fact, it's not that it could not have, but in fact, in the history, the history of the building shows us that it was not first conceived and then constructed, but it was conceived and that conception gave grounds for starting to imagine how to build it at the end of this process, there was an iterative loop. The one is to go, wanted to go back to conception, change some of the fundamentals of conception, and see whether that could have been built. Now, I'm not arguing for a moment that this is an ideal way of building anything. I guess what I'm saying is that this is what makes the project an almost unicum in the history of modern construction. It's almost like a, a Gothic cathedral. So it is a building that owes a very large part of its, of its presence today to construction decisions. Not to conceptual decisions, but to construction decisions. And I'll give you an example in a few minutes. But, um, 
so this is one thing. The other thing is that um, it is a building that, because of the complexity in making it happen, required even Arup, because at the time was actually <coughs> being contracted as project manager, not just a <coughs> structural engineer. So Arup was the engineer or the technical profession in charge of the management of the entire project, particularly in stage two, which is the erection of the structure, of the superstructure. But so I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, at the time, because of the construction components, uh, it became very, very important as well to choose the actors. So who should be the general contractor of the Sydney Opera House? Someone who had built high-rise buildings in the CBD, right next to the Sydney Opera House. Someone who built public infrastructure, train, stations, uh, uh, terminals of all sorts, or someone who built bridges. And in the end, uh, someone who built bridges was actually selected to build the Sydney Opera House. That's and not very interesting, yeah. <laughs> and not only someone who had built bridges, but someone who had engineered bridges. So we have uh, this particular company, which is called Hornibrook, uh, which unfortunately is not being celebrated to the extent that it should, that is brought into the project to actually provide the type of expertise in real time, if you will, uh, on the construction site to make very quick decision as to how this building should be built in practical terms, particularly, as you know, with, um, with, um, with the casting of the various pieces. Yeah. Okay. So they are collaborating with Arab. Well, <clears throat> not only they were collaborating with Arab, but in their contract, Arab explains that some of the structural decisions must be left to Hornibrook. And so uh, Arab produces drawings. The architect doesn't produce drawings, essentially. So, you know, this is a myth that somehow is... Um, is worth the bunking. Not, 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 not to criticize the architect because I think that generates interesting questions about relationship between architecture, engineering and construction. But in fact, Woodson's office produced very few drawings for the, for the building that we see that we can admire today. Very few drawings. I'm talking about less than 50 drawings. Wow, okay. <laughs> that's great. Less than 50 drawings, whereas the structural engineer produced 700 drawings, uh, and whereas the general contractor produced in excess of 5,000 drawings. Okay. Now, at the very beginning, the contractor is nominated. So there is a pre-nomination of the contractor because they realize that for constructing such a building in fast track, so by making conception and construction move together, progress together, they need to have someone who's done this sort of work one way or another before. So that's why Hornibrook is chosen. He had built several segmental arches in Australia already. And um, an Arab speaks with him. They have lots of, um, lots of um, time for each other before starting the project. Arab invites Hornibrook technical representatives to London in their offices and they work uh, even without a contract for three or four months, uh, to actually set up the construction strategies for the building. And so this comes before Arup starts doing the final structural design of the building. So in order to understand how the building must organize itself component by component, they first need to understand how it's going to be erected. At this time, was it already clear that it's going to be a spherical shape? Or was this the time that it was... Uh, this key? is the time right after, <clears throat> or essentially at the same time, when Utsun comes up with this idea of the spherical shape. So essentially the surfaces of the shell, the shell are going to be taken from the same spherical surfaces and they will actually give rise to a series of, uh, to a series of spherical uh, ogival um, arches with a, with a, central, um, with a central ridge. Um, at this point in time, of course, this uh, Arup has an incredible role to play into the, into the, into the second conceptualization of Utsun's idea. So Utsun produces, produces in I think in September 1961, 
um, a book in which he shows his ideas for the building according to the spherical solution. And this is the base from which Arup starts working on the building. And they call upon um, Hornibrook to come into the office and consider how Utzon's idea can be translated into a manufacturable piece of structure. Um, uh, we still can attribute this idea of the spherical shape to Utzon. This is, yes, by it all is, means. This is uh, the idea, the authorship of the idea is Utzon's. So there's no doubt. So this is the, this, you know, you can, it's, it's almost a eureka moment. Okay, eureka that takes a moment, that takes a few months, but nevertheless. So, so it's something that uh, has a certain conceptual elegance uh, and is to be attributed to the architect. One of the, one of the, one of the things that uh, sometimes, actually very often, we fail to acknowledge and to take into consideration is that ideas at no scale. The moment you give an idea the order of magnitude that it requires in order to be built, other elements come into the picture. So Utzon's idea was conceptually very elegant, so it's kind of crisp and uh, very logical. The problem is that in order to build ogival arches of that size on that particular site, you need to um, put a series of, um, um, of um, additional construction elements in place that were not considered in the initial idea. I'll give you an example. If you um, open the website, if you connect with the website of the Sydney Opera House, there will be a number of uh, videos, very well realized videos, that talk about the geometry of the building. And of course, the spherical solution. Now, if you take these videos and the narrative in these videos at face value, it will look like by using a spherical solution, you can actually start carving, cutting sort of stripes of surface and put them together in a topological relationship. And so everything, all the, all the ribs of the Sydney Opera House will be exactly the same. The problem is that if you need to build it and then post tension it and put all the elements in place, they would allow you to, uh, to in a sense, um, give, give, give physical presence to those uh, procedures then you need to have places for temporary building, for final building, for pre-stressing, for the false work that has to be in place. So in the end, the sales of the Sydney Opera House consist of roughly 2,400 pieces. And if we listen to the narrative, you know, the various books that have been published on it, and also the videos on the Sydney Opera House, this would actually give rise to incredible opportunities for industrialization, uh, streamline economy, stri streamlining economies of scale and all of that. In reality, of the 2,400 pieces that were built, I can't remember exactly, 2,389, something like that, sir, 1,600 were unique one-off pieces that had to be cast individually in order to be able to be assembled on the on the overall arch because each rib of the arch had a different structural function to absorb. Okay? Yeah. So on the one hand we have this pristine, very elegant idea. On the other hand, the moment we start dirtying our hands with construction, the, the, you know, the, 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 the challenge becomes much more complex and I think that that's where the interest lies. He you now, you know, concepts, huh? become reality through the, I guess, the, the contamination of the original idea with the, with the reality of the, of the world. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Is there, is there any um, like particular, of course there were many technical challenges. Yes. Would you think there is one particular uh, which we can talk about? I don't know, for example, this pre-stressing or the, the false work, how, yes. how did they manage? Well, look, I, I think that um, this, is, this is what makes the, interesting, the, the building interesting, I think, because it becomes like an encyclopedia of, um, of, um, of construction in every, in, every possible, um, in every possible aspect. So I guess that um, 
you know the the things that uh, that are worth um, highlighting are the things that also strike one's imagination. So I can think of um, I can think of two. The first one is the telescopic arch that was um, <coughs> that was um, set up by the general contractor. So it was something that was actually conceived by the general contractor rather than the structural engineer to build a building. But interestingly, the design of the te this telescopic arch, which I'm going to describe in a moment, uh, was actually very similar to the, um, to the drawings that had been put together by Utzon and more specifically by Rafael Moneo, that has a very young architect traveled to Sydney to work with Utsa on the Sydney Opera House and is the author of, uh, of the very famous drawing, which is this drawing here with the spherical solution. If we look at the, the telescopic arch and the drawings, the shop drawings for the telescopic arch, they almost they resemble almost exactly the drawing done by Rafael Moneo for the concept of the building. So that means that in a sense the infrastructural equipment that had to be used on the construction site to build the idea, had to duplicate the idea in order to be able to sustain its geometry. And that is the only, well, maybe the, you know, the, the, the same type of work done by uh, Richard Meyer for the construction of the Jubilee Church in Rome. But other than that, I don't know many other pieces of construction equipment that are the exact copy of the of the building or the building, the building part that they're going to build. Of course, now you're going to correct me because Pierluigi Nervi will be another, <laughs> another, another example, maybe Eladio di Este as well. But if we actually stay with Utsum, so we had this telescopic arch that essentially was, was an arch that changed, an assembly arch, so something that would, 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 would allow the, the, the segments of the arch to be lined up and closed um, all the way to the ridge, um, to the ridge beam, uh, had to move, had to move because the ribs were constructed one at the time. So they were constructed one at the time by using a crane that had a limitation in, um, in, uh, in loading, so all the pieces could not um, surpass. Um, a certain um, uh, threshold, but because of this we needed a telescopic arch, a, a movable structure that could actually adapt its geometry to the change in geometry of the building. And so the arch would be the base against which the, the segments of the, the precast segments would be laid out uh, and then they would be uh, post-tensioned once the rib was finished. Then the arch would change position by one rib then there was the existing rib that had been just set up. Then there would be the space available for the segments of the second rib to be positioned. And then the arch would provide the other, the other support. All the way until the, the completion of the sale. Now, if we look at the images of the Sydney Opera House and the profile, we'll say that even though the surface, the geometry of the surface is the same, the section changes. And that gives you an idea of the inventiveness, the ingenuity of the arch that had to follow the growing shape of the building as it provided the support for the laying out of the segments. And it's interesting to know that, uh, well, personally, I think this is the most ingenious piece of construction equipment in modern history. After the completion of construction, it was scrapped. And so this particular type of equipment is no longer in existence. So that means, in effect, this was actually considered to be something of service to a building rather than something technologically valid in its own right. So we talked about the UNESCO listing. I think that that particular piece of equipment would have been worthy of UNESCO listing itself, but unfortunately was actually disassembled and possibly sold. By the, by the pound at the, at the um, uh, construction material market. So this was one thing. The other thing is the, is the, the formworks. It was set up by the contractor in order to cast the various pieces. So even here, so, so, uh, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to in a sense convince you of the importance of construction into the design of this building.
And so going back to the initial idea of the of the ribs of the, of the sails that all come from the same surface. So Utzon used um, an image of a of a, of a of an apple, I think, or yes, yeah, so it was no, 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 no. It was not. Um, you know, when he shows uh, how to um, how to put them together, so it's like a fan. Okay. Yeah. Really, literally a fan also because that was the size of the, the model that they created. And uh, you know, not many people pay attention to the fact that every rib, every element of the fan is tapered. And it tapers in two directions. It tapers along the section of the building, so they're much thinner at the base uh, and, um, and, um, and um, larger, larger at the top, uh, as well as uh, on the surface. So they're much narrower at the bottom and then they become wider at the top. So here you have to organize the formwork of something that grows into, tapers up in two dimensions. Uh, but you actually have to do it on a construction site, which is extremely, extremely tight. Okay, So there is no other way to cast the elements out of that on site during the logistics of um, construction. And they also have to be very, very fast because the building is trying to catch up with the actual timeline, the political timeline. And so it seems to me, if I remember correctly, I think they had to make two of these, two large ribs, casting two large um, ribs um, per week, but I may be wrong. But so it's a huge amount of work with casting segments that are all different. And so the general contractor here uses his prior experience with other segmental types of construction and produces formworks that all um, run on, uh, on, on registers in different dimensions. And there's hydraulic jacks that uh, allows them to, to, to move uh, the, um, uh, the um, you know, what do you call it, the, well, the scaffolding uh, in, in and out of the, um, in and out of the, of the, of the axis. Uh, and uh, they come up with something which is extremely um, shrewd uh, from an industrial design point of view because it's always the same piece. It's always the same piece of equipment that is used uh, and it changes form. We're talking about early 1960s. So there are no computers, although one has been used to do some calculations on the building. But, um, um, but it was the only one available at the University of Sydney, if I remember correctly. Um, but so the contractor has to use ingenuity. Uh, so it's a particular type of engineering in order to come up with a piece that moves uh, in order to allow the casting of different elements that follows the same geometrical progression, but they're all different. And then the very, very um, quick um, undressing of the, of the formwork. Okay? Um, even this, unfortunately, we don't have these formworks. In fact, they've gone... They, you know, they've been lost, they've been destroyed. And th this is the reason for my very contemporary um, interest in the Sydney Opera House, because we managed to find the drawings of the formwork. And so uh, we found them two years ago in a, in a public archive, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And so with that uh, and through that, we were able to reconstruct the process of casting the pieces and eventually building up the building up the work. Until then, we've been using construction photographs, we've been using the, the sketches of the architect, the, the, the few drawings that I talked about made by the architect, which in a sense uh, are inadvertently maybe the cause for the, for the misperceptions <laughs> about the building. So if we don't have anything that proves the opposite, we can say that in fact it was a very, very practical, streamlinable construction process, industrializable, economies of scale and all that, whereas in practice that required a lot of additional work to be put in place. Okay. And so, you know, this is the, also the, you know, to what extent uh, construction drawings uh, are important in the conception of the building or in the, in the actual presence of the building and how important should they be for people like us who are interested in uh, not only in the final building, but also how one arrived at that one. In the Sydney Opera House, without the construction drawings, one cannot understand how the building was actually built.
yeah that, that's that's a kind of crazy also yes yeah um you mentioned nervi earlier yeah. so i am obliged to make a bit of a parallel please, now please, to, please, to, please, to, yes. to nervi and um could you tell me maybe the difference between uh, a, this project of the sydney opera house and the different projects that nervi worked on because they used very similar technologies like yes. on-site prefabrication and then assembly uh, both of them used uh, arches also let's say Felix Candela Ten. and other engineers at the time they used mm, shell structures mm. even without being really able to calculate them yes yes but there is there is a difference in this project and I would yes. like you to talk about look it. I, I think I think that um, there is a cultural difference, it's, you know, huge cultural. These are, we're talking about worlds apart, where you know the use, um, the arrival of the particular solution, is not the real, the, the, the real issue, but is where they started from in order to arrive at that solution. So there are differences between uh, uh, between the work of someone like Nervi and the work of someone like Arab, for instance. The Sydney Opera House is a project that is very, very different from Nervi's projects, other perhaps that the buildings that Nervi designed in Australia because they were in collaboration with an architect. But when we think of Nervi's work in the way in which it described, is essentially his own work. So he's the conceptual designers and a designer and he's eventually the general contractor as well. In this case, we have a very, very broad, wide social division of labor because we have an architect, then we have another architect, then we have two different contractors, then we have uh, the same engineer that also works as a project manager. So the, the, the richness of the way in which the, of the patterns of labor division are very different. Now, Arab, Let's start from Nervi, um, uh, with Pierluigi Nervi. So Nervi is interested in, 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 in the didactic power of structures and structural form. So in a sense you look at a building by Pierluigi Nervi and you understand how forces move across, um, across the building and how the volume of the building is actually going to determine, be determined formally by those very... Um, uh, forces by gravity and all of that. In the Sydney Opera House it is not the case. The Sydney Opera House, the structural solutions that were adopted, were adopted in order to respond to a sculptural uh, mandate. So the mission of the structure of the Sydney Opera House is sculpture as opposed to being rational. And that's the reason why that structure changed over a period of time, essentially over, over six years. So it's number of different solutions that almost have nothing to do with the previous one because it is an instrumental strategy this is the shape that we want to get how can we get to that shape yeah whereas in every is the other way is the other way around this is how the structure works this is how the space requires that structure to work how can we make the building reflective of that structure so the most um, um I would say, yes, in terms of, fabri uh, of prefabrication, it's, I would say that the casting of the formwork is actually quite similar. Maybe that in Nervi there is a conceptual elegance which is more advanced from, uh, from a former point of view than it is in the Sydney Opera House. I would say that the casting, the pre-casting of the Sydney Opera House is actually very um, clever from an industrial design perspective. If one considers, for instance, how the various pieces are cast and then organized on the side in order to be picked up and, uh, and assembled. So it's very much uh, lean construction 30 years yeah. ahead yeah. of lean construction. But um, if we take one particular um, element of the Sydney Opera House is the, 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 the four columns that are normally not uh, part of the official narrations. In fact, they are completely concealed behind, um, behind, the, behind the, 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 the spring of the arch, I mean the fourth spring of the arch, uh, of, the, of, the, of what's called octopus, which is the pieces at the center of the sails uh, from which all the arches depart. And so we have, uh, there are four columns, four columns that are very visible in the construction photographs. Um, 
uh, because they actually provide other struts uh, that support the uh, support the, 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 the base of the arch. So in fact the arch doesn't start where it's supposed to start but it starts after the second precast segment. And, um, and so one normally doesn't talk about them. So of all the monographs of the Sydney Opera House there is only one that cites that refers to the presence of the four columns. All the others can continue the line of um, the line of um, you know, rhetorical line that considers the Sydney Opera House as a series of um, a, a, um, a series of full arches. Um, now, if we if, if we look at the Palazzetto dello Sport in uh, in Rome by Nervi, so essentially the same time. Uh, because the Olympics were in 1960, so talking about 1959-1960, and the spherical solution is 1961. So in Nervi we have uh, the, um, um, you know, the, 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 the base of the arch, which is then supported by a strut, uh, which becomes the rhythm of the, of, the, of the cylinder that provides the base for the dome. Right? And it's very, very visible, and is that what provides the rhythm of the facade? Well, the same solution is actually adopted in the Sydney Opera House, but it is concealed behind it, behind the sails. And at the same time, the concealment is used to, de to develop a different type of narrative. So anyone that studies the Sydney Opera House is actually convinced of the integrity of the arches, and in a sense, the, the purity of the solution. Whereas in fact, if we actually move behind the facade, there will be another four columns, two in the main hall, and two in the secondary hall that uh, actually provide stability to the arch. Today, they are, are completely concealed by the internal, uh, by the feet out. So it's very, very difficult to find them and to see them unless you know of their existence. But in a sense, we have uh, uh, a, you know, a, a nervy-like building inside the Sydney Opera House vis-a-vis -a, -vis a nervy building which shows the structural logics uh, that have organized the, the architecture of the building. So if you, you mentioned Candela as well, you know, Spain had a lot to say about, I mean, Spain, the Spanish press had a lot to say about uh, the construction of the Sydney Opera House, possibly because of, uh, of uh, Candela's and Torroja's tradition and all of that. So. And then Candela very famously wrote something in the early, um, uh, in the mid-60s about the Sydney Opera House and the fact that the Sydney Opera House should be condemned as a sort of building that would disdain the most elementary rules of uh, gravity and physics and structural engineering. Now, if one looks um, at, at Candela's, um, um, considers Candela's um, comments in relation to the building as we know, as we know in images, eh? well, it's Candela's, um, Candela's um, opinion. Whereas if we actually look, we go into the depth of the building and see how, in a sense, the solutions adopted change according to the needs of that particular construction stage, then one understands Candela's position, because Candela's position is one of absolute rigor conceptually, and it is a rigor that has to be translated from the foundations all the way to the, um, to the envelope and to the cover of the building, whereas here we can see that this solution changed across the history of the building depending on what was needed. For example, the four columns that I cited before needed to go all the way down to the, the bed, to the, the bottom of the harbour. And so in order to do that, uh, um, 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 additional structural vertical elements cast in situ had to be put into the base of the building. So in a sense we go up, we find the solution during construction to sustain part of the structure that otherwise would not be able to stand up and then we go all the way back to the foundation to remediate in a sense to something that was not there. Yeah. So there is a there is a you know there is a there is a I don't know what the word could be but there is a a certain nonchalance <laughs> yeah. with the yeah. with the use of uh, structure you know very very shrewd I mean very very clear very quick because the the building we have to consider the building was been built at the time so you don't have time to reflect.
But it's interesting that even Peter Rice, that was the um, engineer in charge on the Sydney Opera House, very, very young, one of the first very, very strong, um, very important commissions, then he writes his autobiography. He has a photograph of the, of the, of the shells, of the, of the sails of the building with the ribs in the foreground and the columns right next to the rib. And in the photograph, the caption says nothing about the column. Yeah. So in a sense, there is a rhetoric about one's own work conceptually that withstands as well uh, the changes, the modification that have been brought about by construction. Yeah. I would like to just, to si. in, sorry to interrupt you, I would like to speak uh, quickly about Peter Rice. Yes. Because I think he's an interesting character and also he became a uh, very famous engineer after. Yeah. And from other projects, I have the impression that he's kind of um, one of the first characters of, or engineers that kind of bends to the needs of the architect. Hmm. Um, so I have two examples uh, here in, in Lausanne. Uh, one is the uh, Rolex Learning Center, right. uh, which is quite well known. And the other one is the Mudak Museum. Mm. I, I don't know if you know it. It's, it's yeah. just opened right now. So um, I would say, for example, the, the Rolex uh, Learning Center is also kind of a false shell, which yeah. started as a shell, but then evolved during the project. And now it's not really a shell anymore, but just a pre-stressed slab. And the Mudak Museum, yeah. close to the train station, is also a very interesting structure because when you go in inside, or if you look at it from the outside, you go in the inside, it's yes. a tectonic of uh, concrete uh, pieces, yes. of uh, concrete slabs, and you have the impression that it rests uh, mm. on, on kind of two uh, contraposing pyramids. Whereas in reality, mm. it's I saw it during construction and it's a, it's a piece of steel construction. Mm. And then they suspended all the, the concrete elements to the, yeah. to the steel construction. And this is kind of uh, works. We have the impression the, arch the architect has an idea mm. and then this is the idea. We have to find the, an engineering solution to it. Well, so do you want me to comment on it? Yeah. Or do you want um, yeah, look, I think we're talking about, um, we are talking about... Um, Maybe you can start from Peter Rice yes, yes. in order to, to No, no, but look, expand. It, exactly. So it's, um, you know, if you can see the Peter Rice's uh, career and um, the type of buildings that he was, um, he got himself involved with, I would say particularly with Renzo Piano from my own point of view, there is a, um, there is a very, very close collaboration between uh, architect and engineer but it is a collaboration which is um, um, uh, synergetic and uh, and um, and um, completely organic I mean it's they, it happens at the same time so with rice it seems to me that with rice uh, you don't have uh, engineering that follows architecture even temporally so you don't have an architect that comes up with an idea and then there is an engineer that uh, finds ways to, to make it stand up. But you have someone that works uh, in concert with the architect to define not only the idea but also the formal, the formal um, consequences of those ideas. If you think, um, uh, well, you know, uh, you know, of course, the, 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 the Beaubourg Centre with the Gerberette, which is essentially is not only once a structural solution, but becomes the kernel, the, the, the intellectual kernel of the, of the proposal. But even the Padre Pio church, the Renzo Piano designed uh, in, uh, in, uh, in southern Italy, in Apulia, in the 1990s, but that rise had actually conceived at conceptual level um, uh, a few years earlier, right before his, um, his untimely death. So there you have uh, a, a concept that has to do not only with the geometry of the structure but also with the use of the materials in that case the stone that's used for the arches segmental arches this time made of stone without the struts and also with the way in which those arches are going to be built so peter rice is a is a 
um, is someone that uses engineering as a way of uh, giving a structure, not physical structure, conceptual structure to the entire process, to all the phases of the process. Um, it seems to me that um, today it's become more difficult for engineers to, to do it. And not because of, not because of the, the discipline itself, but because of the function that these buildings have. So somehow, of course, there are exceptions. You know, I think there is a big difference between the, the parliament uh, that was uh, uh, here in Lausanne and, um, and the museum, particularly the second one that you've um, cited, in a sense that in one case you have um, uh, the, the spatial solution and the engineering solution that has be, be developed, I'm talking about the parliament, uh, um, the cantonal parliament, uh, has been developed in response uh, to you know, a design ambition which includes everything. So it includes the environmental design, includes the typology, includes the positioning of the members of parliament, includes the functioning of the roof, uh, the um, uh, you know, ventilation and all of that. In the other cases that you've cited, particularly the museum, there is a very strong emphasis on the, on the slogan, on the message of the museum, which is a message produced by and large through the envelope as opposed to the museum or to the building as a as a as a you know as a complex behavior machine behavioral machine and so at that point so engineering comes second comes second i mean i know you know very well the engineers and they had my utmost respect uh, but in a sense they had to in a sense find the way to respond to something that had already been set essentially um, with regard to the Rolex Center, um, I think the Rolex Center is interesting with respect to the Sydney Opera House um, because somehow has become, has reproduced the same narrative of the same rhetoric of the Sydney Opera House. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to clarify myself. So the Sydney Opera House as a, as a conceptual structure that in principle should work in a particular way, but does not. And notwithstanding this particular fact, which is an historical fact, is reality, the press has continued to describe it, not only the press, but also the Sydney Opera House itself, to describe in a way that shows the, or emphasizes, celebrates the purity of the concept. So somehow, the purity of the concept is something that cannot be touched. You know, less to, less to diminish the value of the, the building. And to a certain extent, I think what you just said about the Rolex Center falls into the same category. So we have something that comes from the initial concept of the architect, the, 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 the metaphor that um, Sana used, uh, you know, of this, um, of this um, <coughs> um, plane that almost lands on the, um, on the surface of, um, of Epifel. And then, of course, gravity forces us to find compromises yeah okay and it's interesting how uh, in fact it's not only it's not only the structural solution that has changed compared to the conventional description but it's also the detailing of it so if you look at um, at the presence of the patios or the location of the patios in the Rolex Center well they've changed at least three times okay and so the patio itself is a as a as an architectural element stays, but somehow we have to start moving them around in order to permit, or to try and permit, the, the, um, the landscape to actually work as a shell. Eventually, we can't make it work yeah. as a shell. Then. And yet, there are other, other, other propositions, proposals, that try and, and consider what it would have been like if the patios had been moved all around in order to make it work a shell. And of course here I'm referring to the particular thesis that was produced in the laboratory yeah, of yeah. Aurelio, Aurelio Montoni. But nevertheless, um, and so what happens with the, with the Rolex Center is that at the end, uh, we find ourselves with a list, not only with the arches that define you know the the supports for the for the for the slab in between um, 
um, in between the um, you know the seven arches that um, that defines the the triangles of the shells, but um, um, also the three elements that are on the larger part. You know, so we have one individual column, then we have a structural staircase for vertical circulation, which is a structural element, and then we have the wall, right, the yeah. sept. Uh, towards the end of the perimeter, which is in fact two columns, two steel columns, and not a concrete wall. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> so there you have something very, very interesting. Because um, I, look, I, I find it a very interesting solution from an architectural point of view. Um, but somehow the architects have wanted to conceal that sequence in order to make it look as a catalogue of different elements. So you have. A punctual element, the column, then you have a, a, a geometric volume, which is the cylinder, and then you have a plane. Even though, in fact, the plane conceals two other elements. Okay. Um, um, so, the, 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 I guess the, the question implicit in your, uh, the, the other question implicit in your initial question, in what is the relationship between uh, architectural instructions constraints? Uh, and engineers or engineering's uh, ability, latitude to intervene onto the rationalization, optimization of the structure. And uh, look, this is a this is a chicken and egg uh, problem. So you know we could spend um, months talking about it here. I think that the, the the most important thing. I think look, I think the architect in this particular case. Um, um, Sana had all the all the um, you know all the, all the all the right in the world uh, to actually maintain the initial solutions, and you know I know there have been a lot of there's been a lot of negotiation between the structural engineer and architect in order to move some of the pieces in order to make it possible for the building to perform as um, is rhetoric. Uh, yeah. imagined it to perform. Um, at the same time, I think that the, you know, the problem is the way in which we talk about these buildings. So it's not how these buildings have been eventually developed because, you know, there is due diligence has been applied. Someone has won the right to design the building in a particular way out of a competition. The problem, as I see it, is that both in architecture and I should say engineering as well, we tend to idealize building projects in a way that move away from the reality of their construction. So in fact, with the Rolex Center, those three elements that to me show the complexity of the structure, the limits of what's today is possible, would allow you to start making considerations about the use of materials and the resources, the amount of resources used to make a one-story high building. In a sense, they get diluted by our way of privileging a solution which is, uh, which is fictional, essentially, it doesn't exist, as opposed to delving into the solutions that were adopted to materialize the building. And I think this is a, this is a problem that we have. Yeah. I think, yeah, maybe we can move towards uh, to an end of the interview. Yes. And I would like to bring up the subject of complexity mm. because I have to also the feeling that buildings are becoming more and more complex. They have to respond to, mm. they have to do multiple purposes. Yeah. Um, the requirements for fire safety, for insulation, for environmental aspects and sure. all these things, they are, uh, every discipline is mm. becoming more complex and the building has to respond to all of them. Yeah. So, of course, we would like to tell uh, a narrative, like mm. uh, we, have to we have found a pure form and we have optimized, for example, uh, the structure or the structural mm. engineering like NERVI did, mm. but maybe in NERVI's time there were less constraints Mm. from other disciplines and today yeah. all of these disciplines make it so that probably we cannot optimize our structural engineering or and it should not be one of the only problems or yeah, only yeah. yeah. Yes. and th this brings me also um, and I would like you to comment on this to the design process mm. like there is the conceptual design which is uh, an idea a way uh, we, th we thought about something mm. and then 
there is the actual design and yeah. construction. And probably it is that 10% of the work is done in the conceptual design and mm. 90% of the work is during mm. the, the final design, the tender design uh, and the construction. Mm. It is where engineers speak to uh, construction companies to have their advice. They, they mm. uh, interchange with the architect, they come back to the project, they change something, they talk with the fire engineer and so on. Yeah. And we almost, in our narratives, we never talk about that. Yeah. And that's also a problem a bit for our students because yes, when yes. you go into the actual construction business, you have one idea, but when you then actually start to work, it's something different. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, look, uh, um, a few years ago, I wrote uh, an article for Harvard Design Magazine. I think, yes, I think, look, my memory starts, but that should be Harvard Design Magazine in which I said, I made a proposition. I said, look, why don't we actually kidnap the authors for the moment? So we'll kidnap everyone who's normally assigned to the design of the building or to the construction. We'll put them in a room. We lock them up and we throw away the key so that we're actually free to look at the building and the work that was done to make the building stand. Why am I saying this? Because I think our way of looking at construction is highly conditioned and dependent on professional traditions, on professional history. So there is an engineering way of looking at a building, there is an architectural way of looking at a building, there is a mechanical services way, and that somehow pulls us away from the nature of the building, which cannot not be an amalgama an interaction of all these things. But we're so preoccupied with understanding the contribution of the structural engineer or the contribution of the architect or the contribution of the fire engineer that we tend to forget that these things are related. So, um, <clears throat> I think, you know, for, for a number of years um, I have been a proponent of the following thing, that we should start considering what project means. So in fact, not project, uh, but project. So not project as a noun, but project as a verb, because the project comes from that one, right? So in order to be able to project an idea into a reality, what do we need to do? Well, we need to um, develop a series of responses to the problems of the building. Not only the problems of the final building, but the problems of the process of the building. So I normally say that there are 12, 15 different design dimensions. There is one dimension that has to do with form and space. One dimension that has to do with, uh, um, with support. One dimension that has to do with manufacturing. One dimension that has to do with environmental controls. Another dimension that has to do with purchasing. Another dimension has to do with change. Another dimension has to do with testing, all of that. So each one of these things has a design component. Now, design in, in French doesn't work in the same way, but in English it's quite, uh, it's quite literal because design comes from the designio. And designio comes from designo, which means in Latin to show something through drawing, through marks. Okay? I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that each one of these problems needs its own drawings. Without those drawings, you can't solve that problem. Okay, so there is each design component as its own language, as its own vocabulary, and its own instruments of service. We tend not to look at these instruments of service, but we tend to listen to a couple of stories. And the moment we listen to a couple of stories, uh, we tend to lose the, you know, the, the, the entire one. If I ask you a question, where are the services at the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, what would you say? No idea. No idea? Yeah. <laughs> well, they are hidden in the structure. And sometimes there are other components that are not structural that are put there in order to make sure that the mechanical services that are part of the structure go along with the ones that are not part of the structure. So there is a very, very coherent, cohesive, integrated way of design that is not to do simply with the shape, but how that particular space will work. This is something that we don't have. We don't have in school. I must say with a certain amount of regret, uh, if I ask students, my students in architecture, to look at the building from this point of view, there will not be as much interest 
as to treat the same building as the as the byproduct of someone's mind. But at the same time, this is this is today is one of the most important things to do. So, I I am a strong proponent of changing the the meaning of the word technology. I mean, you know, the the literal meaning of the word technology. You know, it's made out of two words, Greek, techne and logos. So it means that we have to reflect logos. We need to think about the technique. So it's not about how to do something, but it's about what to do and why. <laughs> so if you take technology from this point of view, anything that we do today must have a very complex um, discussion underlying and underpinning everything. So if I make a, if I you know, choose a structural solution, well, I choose a structural solution on the basis of the elegance of the solution. I use it on the basis of the efficiency of the spaces that I produce. I use it on the basis of the marginal increase of materials that have, has to be used in order to cantilever something. For example, as opposed to have a simple, a simple vertical support, um, you know, we can look at thin, a thin um, um, uh, vaulting at the moment, which seems to be very, very fashionable, right? Yeah. Now it's very, very elegant from a structural point of view. Does it produce the amount of volume that is required in the economies that may make use of it, in the sense that a vault is not as efficient? As, as, as a cube, yeah. in terms of space, yeah. regardless of the elegance of the structural solution. But it's not as efficient in terms of space supply, spatial supply. And so all these things become part of, of our discussion, or should, I think, become part of our discussion. But, uh, but they're not. I mean, you know, you can use uh, uh, you know, as much timber as you want, but if everyone starts using timber, there will not be enough timber. Yeah. So Switzerland imports the majority of its timber for construction. So at that point, you know, what matters is the, is, is the efficiency and environmental efficiency of the, of the timber structure as a structure, or is it the environmental inefficiency of transporting that building or the, the, that material, or the requirement in terms of land that is needed in order to farm that timber? Yeah. You know, that's um, it's, um, it's a tricky question. It's a very tricky question. Yeah. Also, because you know, in Switzerland, we're very lucky, very, very lucky. Not simply in terms of materials, but in terms of the technological, um, the technological um, I I infrastructure and the manufacturing infrastructure. Now, labor in Switzerland is highly skilled at all times. I mean, there have yeah. been different peaks, but uh, different. Uh, um, but in general, it's highly skilled. But if you think about uh, the construction industry in the world, uh, 80%, over 80% of the labor force is unskilled at this moment in time. Over 80%. Okay? And so what do you do? I mean, how do you design your structures? How do you design your spaces? In order to increase the capacity, in order to build capacity in that workforce, or in order to use that workforce as unskilled labor that yeah. will only have to follow yeah. instructions. You know, this is, uh, so buildings are becoming much more complex, even from this particular point of view. Certainly from a technological point of view. Technology is not which materials to use and what structural solutions to use, but it's how you actually bring all these various things together. Today, you cannot design a building without considering its change over time. Yeah, that's, that's true. And that makes some incredibly elegant solutions very difficult. If you've been, if you've been to Uruguay? Uh, no. Okay, if you go to Uruguay, you actually be able to see some of Eladio de Estes uh, incredible buildings uh, that now need to have air conditioning in it. Yeah. Where do you put? The air conditioning <laughs> and so the problem then becomes one of the you know the resilience of the original project vis-a-vis -vis the needs of the contemporary ones because if you can't put 
I'm not I'm, I'm saying a condition it could be much more much smarter solutions by all means but nevertheless there are solutions that have special occupation that require yeah. demand special occupation if you can't do that that building will be condemned yeah. yeah and so if we want to make buildings last and survive in time we need to find a way of considering design which is far more inclusive than it is today regardless i guess of the brilliance of the structural engineers the structural solutions and the special solutions brought out by the architects yeah. okay i think we we can close on this one okay thank you very much for your time and your interview <laughs>